Well, go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church. And as always, I'm thankful and grateful to see each and every one of you. Today is the day you find out who the true morning people are. I am among them and most of you aren't. So I can tell. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew 27. We're going to be starting in verse 11 this morning. But last week we saw the juxtaposition really between Jesus and Judas. The sinless Savior Jesus takes the sin of the world in order to redeem us from condemnation. And then the guilty Judas took his own sin to his grave. Judas paid his own penalty in his life and is still condemned in his sin to this day. An eternal penalty that will never end. And that is the debt that we owe to God. And this week we look at a different uh, type of narrative in verses 11 through 26 as we continue to take a look at Jesus as we move closer and closer to the cross of Calvary. You know, we teach relatively short blocks of Scripture when you consider the narratives as a whole because each section is so rich that it necessitates close study. It is extremely rewarding. And as we do this, it may be helpful for you to step back during the week, maybe reread the narratives in Matthew from Jesus' birth to where we will eventually end up in His death and in His resurrection. And you will see how all of these narratives flow together to form one full story of the gospel of the life of Jesus Christ. And one thing that I think will jump out at you is the righteousness and total innocence of Jesus throughout the entire narrative of Matthew that it is through His life that we find this wonderful narrative that really shows the entirety of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, that He puts Himself in the place that I deserve so that I can have the life that I don't deserve, and that's His life. And this, we're going to see today, this narrative of Jesus before Pilate, as well as the release of Barabbas with the condemnation of Jesus, teaches and reminds us of really just how wonderful the grace of Jesus Christ is, but also just how sinful you and I are. And I want to begin reading there in verse 11 of Matthew 27, and we read, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You've said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, Jesus gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. You know, number one this morning, I want you to see that Jesus is innocent in a world full of guilt. Jesus is innocent in a world full of guilt. Only Jesus is sinless. And so we read this even narrative of Jesus before Pilate. The chief priests are gathered there. They're accusing Jesus of all sorts of fake crimes. They're accusing Him of saying who He really is. And it's only Jesus in that room that is sinless. Every one of them stands condemned under their own sin. The impotent Jewish leaders couldn't even execute Jesus under their own mandate. They had to get permission from Rome. Only the government of Rome could condemn someone to be executed as Jerusalem is under Roman rule at that point. If you go back to Matthew 27, 1, it notes that Pilate was the governor tasked with overseeing the area in which Israel resided in Jerusalem. And so they needed to get his sign off. This passage is not evidence that Pilate is some kind of populist. That's not why he takes him, Jesus, before the people. Rather, Pilate's entire job was to keep Caesar's rule intact, to keep the different places of the Roman Empire running smoothly. And ultimately, Pilate's job was to keep Caesar happy. Pilate's rule was always under threat, whether it be the threat of Caesar executing him and just replacing him under a whim, whether it be there's some type of military insurrection in which the Roman Empire is attacked and Pilate's rule as governor would be unseated in that way. And his rule in Jerusalem was always a bit volatile because the people of Jerusalem wanted to rule themselves, of course, as they all did. And Rome continuously oppressed them. But Israel was somewhat of a theocracy under the Old Testament. And what you see is when Rome comes in, they put some of their 
kind of pantheistic worship in place, some of their dogmatic symbols in place of eagles and other things, and they would put it in the temple, which was blasphemous to the uh, the Jews. And so there would be a lot of insurrections. There would be a lot of riots. And the more and more of those that would happen, the more severe Pilate's oppression of them would be because if too many riots take place and there's too much volatility in the Roman Empire, they would have replaced him because his job was to keep it running smoothly. And so part of Pilate's issue here is that he feels, well, if I don't listen to the chief priests and I say that Jesus is fine, there might be a riot. But of course, at this time, he knows who Jesus is. Jesus was a popular figure in that area. He'd undoubtedly heard from Herod the Great about his his uh, healings and things of that nature of his authoritative teaching. And so he's afraid, well, if I do condemn Jesus to execution, well, then there might be a riot for that too. And so Pilate finds himself kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Keep in mind that in Matthew 26, it's already been established that the Sanhedrin had failed to find a legitimate charge to bring against Jesus. So they had cultivated these false witnesses against Jesus. And when Pilate questions it, he goes to Jesus and questions him about the authority. Did you make these claims or did you not make these claims? And Jesus doesn't directly respond to what Pilate's talking about because Pilate hasn't made any charges. Jesus refuses to address the chief priests. And so when Jesus looks at him and says, you have said so, the word that he's using there is su leges. And the emphasis in that phrase is on the term you. It implies that Jesus is not a king in the sense that Pilate is asking him if he's a king because Pilate really is reducing what Jesus is. Pilate's asking him, are you only the king of the Jews? Because to say that you were the king of the Roman Empire, well, that would be madness. That would be suicide. And when Jesus looks at them and says, you've said so, it's a denial of this because Jesus is not solely the king of the Jews. Jesus has all authority, as he says in Matthew 28. John 18, 29 through 30 even shows Pilate questioning their accusations, the accusations of the chief priest. And the kind of pathetic response of the chief priest is, well, they couldn't make any charges. They basically say, trust us. Would we bring someone who wasn't guilty in your presence? I don't know if they thought that Pilate was just going to very quickly sign off on the condemnation of Jesus. But of course, as you see, that's not what Pilate does. Pilate, rather, begins to ask him questions. There's no legitimate charge against Jesus here. There's no sin that can be brought to condemn Jesus in a legal, legitimate, or even truthful way. Therefore, they have to create these false accusations out of thin air. That's why 1 Peter 2.22 makes the statement that Jesus didn't sin, nor did Jesus deceive them. When Jesus begins to denounce the accusations, saying, you've said so, but this is a foolish charge. Jesus is being completely honest. He isn't being tricky. Jesus is stating the obvious. He's in a room full of guilty men. You can extend that to the whole world. The world is sinful beneath him. And when you don't understand God, which is the problem that the chief priest and Pilate are having, the problem isn't God. The problem is always going to be us. Sometimes when you don't understand what God is doing in your life, the frustration that you have needs to be replaced by a faith and trusting, well, even if I don't understand, God does. And trust me, that is better than you understanding. You want God to be in charge. He is God. He is perfect. I am not. Because what Jesus is really doing here is saying that He is the king of a much larger kingdom than Pilate can even understand. And this dialogue is shown more in the gospel according to John. And in John 18, starting in verse 33, it shows more of Jesus' response. It says, So Pilate enters his headquarters again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? He's saying, Is this just the same old thing the chief priest said? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answers him, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Jesus is operating on a completely different plane than any of them. 
The plane that Jesus is operating on is larger than the Jewish kingdom. It's larger than the Roman Empire. Jesus, in fact, is a threat to Rome. Rome demanded that Caesar be considered a god with unparalleled authority. And Jesus, his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is over this world. His kingdom is cosmic in its reach. He is the eternal God. He is the creator. Jesus has authority over all realms for all time. Jesus didn't need to lead some type of military insurrection against Rome. Jesus didn't need soldiers fighting an earthly battle. He never will. He is God. Jesus is king over all that is. So when you consider the authoritative kingship of Jesus Christ, even in your own life, most of you think too small. Most of you think about Jesus' authority in too personal of a way sometimes. You may think of it and say, Jesus is my king. He's not only your king. Jesus is more than that. Jesus doesn't need your permission to be king. Jesus doesn't even need you to admit that he is the king of your life. You can deny the authority of Jesus. You can say, Jesus isn't my king. That does nothing to take away from the fact that actually he is. He hasn't asked me if he can be king. He hasn't asked me if he can be the Lord of all that is. He hasn't asked me if he can be God. He is king. He is Lord. He is God. He's not just king over you. He's not just king over me. He's king over all people for all time, for all purposes. He's king over this world. He's king over that world. He's king over the entire universe, whether I say he is or not. And so Jesus will never ask Pilate's permission to be king, because that would be submitting to Pilate's authority over him. So Jesus looks at him and says, friend, my kingdom's not of this world. And sometimes we will read that and we will think of that as saying Jesus isn't king over the physical world. Yes, he is. What Jesus was saying is, Pilate, you can't even imagine the extent of my authority. Because my authority is over you, my authority is over Caesar, my authority is over the next Caesar, my authority is over the President of the United States that you haven't even heard of yet, Pilate. (laughs) Jesus is Lord of absolutely all that is. And His purpose was to show His authority through something that seemed unlikely to people like Pilate. His rule was going to lead Him to sacrifice His own life. Why? so that he could show an authority not known. That is the authority over death itself. That's the authority of resurrection. But why would he do that? Secondly, this morning, understand that Jesus is the substitute for sinners. That's why he was in the situation to begin with. Start reading in verse 15. And we're going to read a narrative that is probably known to many of you if you spend any time in church. And there's been a lot of speculation about the life of Barabbas. And I will tell you right now, don't listen to any of that speculation. We don't know anything more about Barabbas than is offered in the text of Scripture. Maybe you've seen some passion films where Barabbas becomes some great Christian and great leader of a church. We don't know that Barabbas ever repented of a single sin. I have no idea what happened to Barabbas after this. And Neither do you, neither does anybody else. But here's what we do know. Now, at the feast of the governor was accustomed, we're in verse 15, to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, While he was sitting in the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Barabbas is a notorious prisoner. We know from the synoptic gospels in John that Barabbas was a thief. Barabbas was a murderer. 
And the language for thief, there's two very similar words for thief and insurrectionist in the original language. And so we understand that Barabbas had led an insurrection, probably the type of insurrection that Pilate had tried to oppress. He had tried to stem down. And so Barabbas is a, is a criminal to Rome. He's a criminal to the Jews. And understand one of the ways that, that Pilate would deal with insurrections, the way that he would deal with riots against his power is he would send centurions into the rioting crowd. They would take off their armor, take off their military uniform as centurions, and they would carry swords under a tunic, and they would sneak up to the rioters, and they would just start stabbing them in the streets. So during riots, it would not be uncommon for dozens of people to be killed. And he was ruthless in the way that he would treat rioters. And so understand, Barabbas is known to the Jews as he's responsible for getting a lot of people killed. But more than that, we understand that the cross that Jesus was crucified on, many commentators speculate that cross was actually meant for Barabbas. And many commentators speculate even further that the two thieves, which again, very similar word to insurrectionists, that Jesus was crucified between may have been co-conspirators with Barabbas. And one of the reasons that they were mocking Jesus on the cross is because they look over and their buddy Barabbas isn't there. Rather, there's this man Jesus who has above his cross written, here's king of the Jews, to mock him. And so understand that this narrative comes together and shows us the substitutionary death of Jesus really in a literal narrative before us. The narrative is self-explanatory, the way that it goes down with Pilate trying to weasel his way out of the situation. He's like, okay, if I do this, I'm going to be in trouble. If I don't do this, I'm going to be in trouble. And so I'm going to use this very popular thing. I'm going to release somebody. Surely they will pick Jesus. The text doesn't tell us this, but I have a feeling that he picks Barabbas because he's like, there is no way they're going to pick this guy. This guy's awful. They hate him. I hate him. There's no way that they're going to ask for a murderer to be released to them. They'll just ask for Jesus and I'll be done with the situation. I mean, his wife was even nagging him about it at that point. I mean, this is the worst day of Pilate's life. So Pilate's like, I'm going to do this. Pilate is ultimately a coward. You know, sin cultivates a cowardice that avoids dealing and prefers to disengage and avoid the reality of your own sin and responsibility. Pilate, even in his authority, doesn't want to take responsibility that he is the one that has to deal with this. He is the one. It's kind of like a child. It doesn't take very much parenting to realize that children are always trying to hide their disobedience from you. They break something and you yell from the other room, what was that? Nothing. Nothing's happening. Don't worry. Trying to get away with it, trying to weasel their way out, trying to blame someone else. Who started it? He did. See, both fingers go both ways. You see, this cowardice extends into adulthood for many, many people. What is it? Ultimately, cowardice is refusal to take responsibility for yourself. And we see this in society right now where people are becoming adults later and later in life, where guys are living in their parents' basement further and further into their 30s. People are putting off pregnancy for so long that we have really a pandemic of what's called geriatric pregnancy. You know, if you're pregnant in your 40s, that's geriatric. Sorry. Don't get mad at me, ladies. But really what we have in this world is people refusing to take responsibility for themselves and they're trying to loft off the responsibility onto someone else. They say, I want to be a child forever. I don't want to take responsibility for myself. And you see adults making mistakes. You see adults getting into sin. You see adults disobeying the Word of God. And you see less and less people willing to take responsibility for themselves. And really what Pilate needed right here is a parent to look him in the face and say, grow up! Deal with it! Pilate says, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with this. And so he tries to get it on the crowd. You are the ones that have to make the decision. The crowd then is so riled up by the priests that they make an unthinkable decision. They beg for Barabbas over Jesus. Commonly known in Sunday school, but don't miss the picture that God is painting for us through this very real event. 
that Jesus is quite literally the substitute for Barabbas. Again, I said I'm not going to speculate on Barabbas' later life, but I will tell you that this picture you are seeing is no accident. Barabbas deserved to die. He deserved to pay the penalty for his own sin. Luke 23, 25 actually states that Barabbas was freed. And what does it say about Jesus? Jesus was delivered over to the will of sinful man. Jesus is quite literally the sacrificial lamb in this narrative. Romans 5.15 explains the gospel and says, The free gift is not like the trespass of Adam. For if many died through Adam's trespass, much more have the, has the, have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Adam's sin in the garden led to all sin. His trespass led for me, being born a sinful man. But note what it says. The free gift is that Jesus' life and sacrifice led to life for many. Therefore, understand, Jesus is the substitute on the cross, your substitute on the cross. He is the sacrificial lamb for the sin of all that exists. And it's easy to read this passage and look at it and find anger for the sinful, deceived, rebellious crowd. And that anger is justified because this is the greatest injustice that you can see. An innocent man condemned while a guilty murderer is set free. Friends, it is unjust that Jesus would die and Barabbas would go free. But this is a picture of the gospel. In John chapter 1, verse 29, it's the narrative of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. And note what happens. It says the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him. And what does he say? He says, behold, the Lamb of God who does what? Who takes away the sin of the world. So friend, when you see Barabbas in this narrative, you see a guilty, condemned sinner deserving of punishment forever. And you see the guiltless, perfect, righteous, innocent Jesus Christ take His place on His cross. But it isn't just Barabbas that deserved that. It's me. It's you. I am guilty. I am unrighteous. I am a sinner. I deserve the wrath of God. And just like Jesus took uh, Barabbas' place, He took my place. I deserve to die. I deserve the wrath of God. But Jesus takes the cross meant for Barabbas, and so do I. Now I have, like I said, I don't know how Barabbas reacted to this. I don't know what his next day was like. But I can imagine that if you're standing there looking down the barrel of being executed on a cross, and then they come to you and they say, by the way, this Jesus is going to take your place. Barabbas, you're free. That's probably a big relief. Oh, are you sure? I just assume he said that. You know who I am, right? <laughs> All right. And I do wonder what Barabbas' frame of mind was as he sees Jesus on the cross meant for him. Did Barabbas realize the cost of his freedom? I don't know. But I do know that if you don't realize the cost that Jesus paid, that you are dead in your sin, just like many in that crowd were. Because Jesus took Barabbas' place, and Jesus took your place. You are not Jesus in this narrative, friend. You are Barabbas. Sometimes people and Bible teachers do this all the time. I don't think they're very good Bible teachers. But they'll take an Old Testament narrative and be like, you're Esther, be courageous. You're not Jesus, friend. It's kind of arrogant to do that, by the way. You're not Jesus. You are Barabbas. And I think to myself, Barabbas must have been grateful. I think about the way that many of us think about the cross of Christ. 
And I think about the way that Barabbas must have reacted, and I think that sometimes we belittle the cross of Christ with just the way that we feel about the cost that Jesus paid for our freedom. If you think about it and you look at it and you say, oh my, I, I love Jesus. I am thankful for what Jesus has done for me. I can never repay Jesus for what he has done for me. What a wonderful Savior. I can't imagine the innocent paying my price. But so often, sometimes people react and they're like, well, I don't want, want to go to hell. It's really cool that Jesus did that for me. Life as usual. Friend, if there is no deep affection for Jesus taking your place on the cross and paying the penalty for your sin, you are not a Christian. If you don't love him, if you're not thankful for him, if you're not overwhelmed when you read the narrative and you see the guilt that was laid on Jesus Christ and you see the price that he had to pay, if you're not grateful, if you're not filled with affection, if you don't love him, then you have no faith in him. Because you don't just give him a nod. You give him your life. Do you see him on that cross realizing that it was for your freedom and for mine? Because the truth is, number three this morning, no one is innocent of the blood of Christ. No one is innocent of the blood of Jesus. Pilate gets even more cowardly. As one of my Bible teachers would say, Dr. Hartman would say, he just got worser and worser and worser. Look at verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, I love the way Pilate looks at the situation because Pilate is basically saying, what's in this for me? Selfishness, cowardice. He says he's gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning. The worst thing that he could have happen. He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Again, coward. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Friend, you cannot cleanse yourself of your sin. Pilate is the consummate politician here. He presents as a man just doing the will of the people. But really what he presents as is a man terrified of people more than he is God. We're raising, unfortunately, a generation of victims. For anything under the sun, it's too hot. You victimize yourself because the sun's hot. And what victimization really is, it's a way to say it's not my fault. Whatever you blame, whether it be some kind of trauma that may have really happened, and it may really be something that causes deep pain in your life, but to use anything that has happened in your life to victimize yourself to the extent where you take absolutely zero responsibility for your actions, that is cowardice. And what you see happen in this narrative is Pilate looking to the crowd and saying, I cannot stand against that. So often, just like we have a culture that doesn't believe the gospel and a culture that stands against us, and so often we cowardly look at the crowd and say, I will compromise because I cannot stand against the crowd. Why are you so worried what people think about you? Why are you so worried about that? I ask my kids sometimes, and I tell them, I say, don't care what anybody thinks about you. Whether somebody's made fun of them or somebody has told them this, that, or the other thing. Why do you care what people think about you? And that's often followed by, those people are morons. Some people question my parenting. (laughs) And I say, it's wise. It's wise. If you don't ever tell your kids that other people are stupid, they're going to do what other people are doing. But if you tell your kids, don't do that because that person's an idiot. They are less likely to do that. And some of you don't do that because you are the idiot that I am warning my children about. Okay? 
I understand your problem. You're probably offended. Well, just stop being an idiot and everything's going to be okay. All right, don't email me. But Pilate is afraid of people. I read Old Testament narratives. I love the Old Testament. I love to talk. I love going through narratives. I find just amazing stories. And from childhood in Sunday school, I would hear the narratives of the Old Testament. I would hear about uh, Baal worship and Molech worship, and I would hear about the Asherah poles that people were built. And it always confused me because I was like, why were people in the Old Testament so stupid? Because I have never walked by a statue and thought to myself, you know, that thing might have powers. Maybe I should bring a meal. Maybe I should worship it. Maybe I should bow before that Statue. I never thought that. And so I would read about the Israelites in Exodus, and they get tired of waiting for Moses, and they're like, he's surely dead. So they take all their gold, and they make a golden calf. And I'm just like, why would you worship a statue of a cow? doesn't make any sense. But then the problem that I have is I don't understand their sin. And I think they're fools when I think about us, and I think we don't even have statues. We just worship people. Fear of man is the same type of idolatry that they struggled with the Old Testament because it is ascribing power that only God has to something that is less than God and is a false God. And so friend, you are no less idolatrous than the people in the Old Testament just because you fear people more than you fear God. You are just as guilty of idolatry. And so Pilate's ultimate problem was that he had a fear problem, and fear problems are always worship problems, and worship problems boil down to idolatry problems. And Pilate had made an idol out of Caesar, and Pilate had made an idol out of the people of Israel because he was terrified of both of them. And yet God the Son, the creator of the universe, is standing right beside him, and Pilate Pilate can't figure out he should be afraid of him. Many of the people in the same crowd respond with an eager willingness to have the blood of Jesus on their own hands. Think about the deception of sin there. If you know anything about worship in Israel, you know that life blood is something that you don't take on to yourself because it will make you unclean. So the Jews in the crowd are looking at Jesus and they're like, His blood be on us, even if it will make us unclean before God and unable to worship Him. That's how deceived they were in their own sin. And think about the cowardice of these people. By the way, many of these same people would in the book of Acts, just a few weeks later, these events are not far removed. And Acts chapter 5 verse 28 would say the opposite of what they say here. They'll basically look to the disciples who are preaching before them and they will say, don't blame us. They say, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you are, you've filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because here they're saying, not only will his blood be on us, put it on our kids. And just a few weeks later, isn't this crazy what sinners will do to avoid responsibility? The lie. I've met many people deceitful enough to where I will have viewed you do the very thing I'm talking to you about, And just a day later, you'll look at me and be like, I don't know what you thought you saw, but you didn't see what you thought you saw. Lying, deceit. Friend, this is what sin will do to you. It cultivates lies because you are trying to save yourself without ever having to deal with just how wicked you are. Understand this. You will pay for your sin even if you deny it. Even if you refuse to take responsibility for it, there's no getting out of it. You cannot lie to yourself and others and pretend that for one reason or another, you are innocent. The end is the same. You are guilty of your own sin. And no matter who you try to blame, who you try to make guilty, the guilt lies on your shoulders and your shoulders alone. Because only Jesus can save anyone. They release Barabbas. They condemned Jesus with a crowd of those that should have known better looking on. Acts chapter 4 verse 11 presents the situation. It says, this Jesus is the stone that you rejected. 
And you were supposed to be the builders, and he has still become the cornerstone. In other words, if anybody should have recognized Jesus, it was the Jews, because God had tasked them to build his house. And the apostles look to them and say, even though you rejected the very stone that was supposed to build that house, God has still made him the cornerstone. You did nothing to slow God down. But here's what I love about the gospel. Acts 4.11 is filled with guilt. Acts 4.11 is filled with blame. Acts 4.11 is filled with sin of you did this, own it. And Acts 4.12 is the grace of God. The very next verse, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He says, this is your fault. You rejected Jesus Christ. And then he says, turn to him and you'll be saved. The very crowd that led to his crucifixion, that stood condemned in their sin, was not out of reach of the grace of God. And neither are you. Neither are you. I mean, think about this. They killed God the Son. They murdered Him in one of the worst forms of execution that you can imagine on this earth. And God looks to them and says, there is salvation in no one else. But you know what He's also saying? There is salvation! If you will turn to the very Jesus that you denied, if you will turn to him, if you will trust him, if you will believe him, he will save you. Friend, I can't imagine a worse sin. Therefore, why do you believe your sin is irredeemable? Friend, there is no one in this room and there is no one in this world that has sinned to the extent where they are out of the reach of God. If God was willing to save those Jews right there who'd crucified Jesus Christ, don't you think He'll save you? Don't you think His grace is sufficient for you? There's no one else that can save. Sounds so exclusive, doesn't it? But it's actually a really, really good thing because it means there is someone who will save me. There's no one else that God has commanded you to be saved by. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. So Barabbas is freed. Jesus was scourged. Isaiah 50, verse 6, prophesied about this. The beatings of Jesus. It says, I gave my back to those who strike, my cheeks to those who pull up the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Why would God the Son give Himself over to this abuse? Because only Jesus can save. Friends, no one is innocent of his blood. We are guilty and only Jesus is innocent. And that sounds like terrible news until you realize why Jesus did this. He did this to take my sin when he took Barabbas' cross. You are not innocent, but you can be redeemed. This very picture is of your guilt. But the cross is also a symbol of your freedom from sin if you will give Him your life. Do you trust Him? Do you love Him? Will you follow Him? Because only Jesus can free you from your very much deserved guilt. A few application points this morning. First, understand that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. You've sinned against a holy and righteous God. Secondly, believe that Jesus is the King of an eternal kingdom. He has all authority. Thirdly, recognize that Jesus is the substitute for sin. He took my place. He took your place. And then fourthly, submit to the reality of your guilt so that you can treasure redemption from Jesus. What a wonderful Savior. 